This is how AV1 wins. Forget graphics cards. This little unassuming card right here is how the entire live streaming and broadcast industry changes and adapts to everything we've been talking about on this channel for years. This is how we'll get AV1 at scale and how even individuals will be able to run industry level broadcasts at low cost. This video is about an enterprise card that you yourself may not buy, but will absolutely affect the videos and streams you watch every day. And I have video samples already. This is the Alveo MA35D from AMD and specifically through their acquisition of Xilinx a little over a year ago. This is a media accelerator card built to accelerate video decoding, processing, and encoding, but it's so much more than that. On this card sits two ASIC-based chips, and they're the industry's first five nanometer-based ASIC media accelerators. This card is capable of decoding upwards of 64 1080p60 video streams, encoding 32 1080p60 video streams, and performs amazing video processing in very little time at just around two milliseconds of throughput latency for 1080p60 and eight milliseconds for 4K60 which is honestly kind of unheard of. All while operating at just 35 watts of power in a half-length, high-height card, assuming you're using all of the streams. Less watts if you're using fewer streams. This thing is built for the future of streaming, supporting decoding for H.264, H.265, VP9, and AV1, and able to encode in H.264, H.265, and AV1. Yes, AV1 at scale. This thing will bring AV1 to so many places where traditional CPU compute-based encoding just can't keep up. The ASICs on this card are laid out pretty interestingly. Each chip has four encoder blocks. Two can do HEVC, H.264, and AV1, and two are purely for AV1. Even the enterprise side is predicting a big shift AV1. The flexibility here is important though, as the transition period to AV1 will mean that plenty of platforms now have to double their encoding workload burden to provide both the AV1 copy of a stream and a more accessible stream like H.264. For example, if Twitch were ever to roll out AV1 support, since their streams are source quality first, passing through the untouched video feed straight to the viewer, they would now need to provide a supplemental non-AV1 stream quality for all AV1 streams sent to Twitch to accommodate viewers who don't have AV1 compatibility or supporting hardware to play it back and watch. The decode blocks here look smaller visually, but can easily handle double the number of encode streams in decoding, which is pretty wild. There's hardware on here for processing and scaling video, and even dedicated processing hardware for actually compositing your, your video streams, even at 4K. Compositing just means layering the different, you know, elements or sources together. So like in OBS, that would be your gameplay, your webcam, your overlays, your alerts, and so on. To do all of this on card and separate from any normal graphics card kind of thing opens up incredible possibilities for lots of workflows. Currently, this is built just for data center rollout with FFmpeg and GStreamer configs, but I have been, you know, talking them up about possibly utilizing the card for OBS Studio or vMix or something like that as the ability to add this card in a PCI Gen 5 motherboard to run your entire stream from would just, you know, just paired with like an iGPU or something would be mind-blowing. We'll see. I'm trying. I'm trying, y'all. I'm trying. The pipeline for this card's use so far would be to receive video streams, be it fully mixed and composited from a video mixing, you know, hardware like an ATEM or a TriCast or industry level gear that I've never even touched before, or to take the individual video feeds entirely, scale and composite those sources together as needed, and then encode that stream to multiple different outputs for multi-streaming, scaling bit rates as needed, and so on. But there's another piece of this hardware that adds another step here before the final encode, the AI hardware. No, we're not talking about AI like tensor cores or anything like that. This is dedicated hardware for AMD to develop applications for to continue to improve your video quality through predictive optimization. It can take the encoded video, the, 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 the video feed you send it and that it has already processed and encoded, determine if bits were allocated most efficiently for the type of content being streamed, and then go back and do a better job on a second pass, all with just one frame of latency. This tech even has the ability to utilize defined regions of the frame with different priority levels to provide the best quality optimizations too, such as in this slide where they show optimizing for the speaker's face. Despite the hardware being ASIC based, that is hardware that's normally built to do specific fixed functions and not really change, AMD does have the ability to continue to update the use of this AI hardware over time as they you know, find better strategies. That's the Xilinx magic. After all, they were known for the first commercially viable FPGAs, which 
you can for, you know, update and change over time. All of this incredible hardware and encoding potential in a tiny single slot card. The best part, the card is only 1595 MSRP, which is going to be a high price to many of you, but consider the number of creators today that buy just as or more expensive graphics cards based solely or mostly on their encoding capacity. And they can't encode anything close to what this card can. So for a certain tier of streamer or enthusiast like myself, the cost is honestly not even that big of a stressor. It would cost much more to get a Quadro from Nvidia, for example, instead of a GeForce card. This dual input 4K 60 card from Magewell alone cost me $1,800. But thinking outside of just the individual, broadcast trucks or racks get equipped with tons of video processing and encoding equipment, or even just basic cable converters start adding up towards this price point quickly on their own. Those people, those techs, they won't even blink at this. Regional sports broadcasts, esports events, and conference broadcast teams will all be able to do so much more for so much cheaper and with less power draw and heat with this little card. Like I said, game changing. I'm also thinking about the future of multi-streaming and individually hosted video platforms. We're already seeing a massive shift from single platform enmeshed creators to creators streaming everywhere all at once. YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, TikTok, Instagram, Glimish, Discord. Nvidia has been struggling to offer unlocked encoding capabilities on GeForce cards for ages, only just quietly up being the limit to five encode sessions in a February driver update. The 32 streams on this card is a very interesting prospect. Combine this with the rising popularity of services like Owncast or PeerTube for running your own video site instances, either as nodes of these services or as dedicated sites like Tilvids. These cards would help scale the transcoding capacities of these sites significantly higher and more cost effectively than traditional graphics card or CPU encoding really ever possibly could. Plus, this can have direct impacts on what you, the viewer, sees very quickly. YouTube just rolled out AV1 streaming support, right? If, if you missed it, video links in the cards and below. <laughs> Much of YouTube's video tech is built around Google's own encoding hardware that I've reported on in the past. These are bigger, take up more data center space and consume more power. And YouTube isn't even delivering live streams in AV1 yet. Twitch, on the other hand, typically relies purely on X264 CPU encoding with data centers packed to the brim with Intel Xeon servers and they buy specific ones that can best brute force their way through the millions of streams run through Twitch monthly. Meanwhile, you can pack like eight of these in just a smaller server reaching up to 256 streams in one machine drawing only 280 watts for the cards. The cost and scalability per amount of power and physical space is truly insane here. That's what dedicated hardware gets you. Amazon has already been deploying the previous Alveo card, the U30, like wild in AWS services. And the new MA35D provides two to four times the power and capacity over the older card. I have zero inside information in saying this, and I could be completely wrong. But if Twitch is going to hit their 2023 to 2024 roadmap for AV1 rollouts, I would imagine a card like this is going to make that so much easier than virtually any other hardware path. I sure hope they get there. All this fast encoding doesn't mean anything if the quality sucks, right? As we saw for years in the graphics card encoding space, and even in Major esports tournaments using dating, dated encoding hardware, just because a video codec itself is capable of looking good, doesn't mean a hardware implementation of that encoder is good. Well, it's good. The people working on this know that I like to be picky when it comes to video quality and comparisons, and they have already released and published their own VMAF numbers. That's Netflix's perceptual quality analysis tool that I've been using to just provide a little bit of data to back up the visual comparisons that I provide for our video codec comparisons. And they publish that for their H.264, H.265, and AV1 encoders. And according to their numbers, the AV1 encoders compete with X.265 slow very strongly. I didn't say X264 slow, no, X265 slow. Something you're absolutely never going to be running, well, I won't say never, but currently you're not, absolutely not running in real time for live streaming. It's a CPU encoder, it won't happen. Is this true? Normally for press announcements, I'd have to say, well, we'll wait and see, but we don't have to wait. I managed to get them to encode a couple of my usual gameplay samples on the card in AV1 for comparison. The video engineers over at AMD were kind enough to send over some AV1 encoded samples using the Supernova encoder running on the MA35D for me to test out 
in my usual bit rates. So we've got two megabits per second, 3.5 megs per second, four, six, seven, and eight megs per second. We're kind of expanding my testing range here as we move into full on AV1 coverage. And yeah, these clips look really good. Even at two megs per second, two megabits per second, which is an extremely low bit rate for, you know, historical contexts with, with their AV1 encoder, it looks uh, about like you would basically expect a Twitch stream to look at full fat six or eight megs per second. It is pretty wild. We have both Apex Legends and Battlefield 2042 in the clips here and it's not bad. And so I went ahead and I got these clips. I ran new AV1 samples on Intel and NVIDIA AV1 because FFmpeg 6.0 just released in February with full AV1 support. So I wanted to have the GPU encoders to compare against along with X265 slow, which is kind of like the primo quality benchmark and then X264 slow, which is the, you know, the, the, the old school benchmark for the old paradigm. And wow, I... <laughs> <laughs> the chart you're looking at right now is a mapping of the VMAF score, which is Netflix's quality and you know perceptual quality analysis tool. The score of that, where 95-ish is considered uh, visually lossless, and whoo boy, X264 slow, which again was the previous benchmark for like Twitch quality, ain't anywhere near these graphs, and they all kind of cluster together. So if we strip away the H.264 codec because it's not super useful here and zoom in a little bit you can see where these AV1 encoders stand alongside X.265 slow in that InVink and QuickSync over on Intel Arc kind of trade blows at, at 2 and 3.5 megs per second but once you hit 4 and up they're basically neck and neck but the Supernova encoder consistently sits a little bit on top of the others, meaning you'd be able to save a little bit of bitrate in terms of achieving the same quality. And it's just underneath the X265 slow encoder. On Battlefield 2042, that sample was a little easier to encode than Apex Legends' crazy look. Uh, and in that case, uh, InVink actually sits, it seems to run away with the easier to encode stuff and sits ever so slightly above QuickSync on every single data point. But Supernova sits above both of them in a not insignificant way. And once we hit two megabits per second, it actually peaks a little bit above the X265 slow benchmark. And at 3.5 megs per second, it is touching it. It is neck and neck there. So this encoder is very impressive. And a, 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 an important piece of context to consider here is that the graphics cards encoder, graphics card encoders can only run a couple of these at a time in terms of encode sessions and just actual performance capability, not even just driver limitations. Meanwhile, this this media accelerator card is running 32 of these at once without a drop in quality. Insane. Now, of course, some of you are going to ask, well, what about AMD's encoder? This does not represent RDNA 3 like the the RX 7000 series cards. Those cards are not represented here, and that is because I've run into some weird consistent bug with the FFmpeg and the Regaia VC Inc. implementations, where the video output I get is constantly 1920 by 1082, and nothing I do to try to fit that resolution back to normal 1080p gets good results. I'll, I'll, if I remember to render it out, I will show you a, a sample graph of there, but the highest I could get the AV1 encoder from the AMD RX 7900 XT graphics card was... 56 a vmaf score of 56 which is below normal h264 stuff i know that's not correct that's not what it looks like we'll have lots more coverage coming soon uh, I, this isn't a full av1 quality analysis i just wanted to show what the encoders were capable of on this device and it's bonkers all of my videos for the past few weeks, including this one, have been strongly focused on the future of streaming and content creation. There's so many exciting things happening, I haven't been this stoked for where the scene is heading in a long time. But to truly appreciate where things are going, I also think it's important to know the past. That's why I set out to make a documentary series about the history of content creation and live streaming. It's called Print Screen, and the third episode focused on the Game Boy camera and its impact through to today just went live on Nebula. 
Nebula is a creator-owned video platform built specifically to give creators like myself, along with many others like Renee Ritchie, Taryn, FD Signifier, and Becky Stern, a sustainable place to make all kinds of content that we want, to fund documentary series like Print Screen that wouldn't be justifiable on YouTube alone, and deliver them to you in higher quality and free of ads. And if all that exclusive and ad-free content wasn't enough, Nebula subscribers also get access to Nebula Classes, high-quality video courses where creators teach you how to create or make movies or speak better. There's a bunch. They're honestly all great, even if you just want to peek at what these people do and don't actually want to do it yourself. Either way, if you sign up using the link below, you can support me directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for a 40% off discount off an annual plan. That's just around $2.50 a month, which is wild. After you're done watching print screen, go check out Lowspec Gamer's side quest series that adds a whole bunch of extra context to his regular videos. I feel confident that aside from adapting the power input to your ATX desktop's power supply, there are many of you watching that would happily fork over the 1595 to use this in your machines right now. Though I do though I urge you to wait for more software support relevant to this side of the scene to happen. I want it and I will keep pushing them on this because I think it's possible. It's not their focus, but I think it's possible. I don't want to spoil future videos, but suffice to say, I see a lot of potential in, for, for, for this card. Stay tuned. Regardless of whether you, the viewer, right now would be buying this card, the fact remains that the MA35D, it's a silly name, the Media Accelerated card, the new one, will be changing the streaming and broadcast industry in a major way and will have direct impacts on what you can watch online. This is how we get AV1 in more places, more quickly, and for lower costs. If you want to learn more about AV1 taking over the streaming world, watch this video on YouTube's AV1 streaming rollout. Otherwise, remember to be kind, rewind. It's exciting times, y'all.